But today we have just an amazing man. Uh, we, we, Rick and I hiked Iron Mountain yesterday. It might have been a mistake. We could have both died being as old and out of shape as we are. But we are here this morning. So there's your first miracle of the day. We hiked Iron Mountain yesterday morning and he told me his story from the day he was born to, the, to today practically. And it is an amazing story about how God called Rick onto the mission field. And we, we people that know Rick uh, call him the Indiana Jones of the body of Christ. One time he called me up and said, hey John, and went something like this. Hey, he calls me up and said, hey, how would you like to fly out over here to Asia, which is about a 16, 17, 20 hour flight, and then we're going to take a three hour train ride, and then we're going to get on a pack mule, and we're going to go for like six hours, and then we're going to hike over this mountain for about three hours to a people I haven't met yet, but I want to go up there and meet with them. You want to go with me? And I was exhausted just hearing him ask me to go with him, and I said, No. <laughs> But I will pay you to go. We'll take a special offering. And uh, this is what he does. And he's been over uh, working in the mission field for how many years now, Rick? A long time. A long time, he says. Three to four decades. His wife, Bev, couldn't make it. She's taking care of her uh, ailing mother right now in her hometown. But Rick is in the house. Rick has got a great message for us. Let's welcome Rick Zachary. Awesome. Good to have you, Rick. Thank you. Love you, man. Love you too, bro. God bless you. It's been, I think, about eight years uh, since I was here last. Uh, you guys are moving, uh, meeting in a place across the freeway, so you've moved locations. Uh, congratulations on your new digs, and uh, I really like it. It's a beautiful place. Um, Please visit my book table on, on your way out if you're a reader. If you're not a reader, don't bother. <laughs> but I have five books out there, or four actually. I didn't bring my Spanish version, but one book on uh, Master of Relationships, how Jesus uh, discipled uh, and led people through relationships. Another on Destiny, which has really been helpful for a number of young people, college and high school age uh, young people, figuring out what their purpose in life is. Um, a book that won in uh, 2014, The Poppy Field Diary, uh, which is my, my only secular book that I've written, but it, wrote, it won the uh, Mississippi uh, Fiction Book of the Year given by the Mississippi Library Association in 2014. So I'm really happy about that. I'm so excited. And, you know, this it's Mississippi. Come on. It's not like... <laughs> It's not like California or New York, but, but there's some great writers that have come out of Mississippi. You know, some lawyer guy that's uh, sold a few books, if you've read John Grisham. In fact, John Grisham won that same award in uh, 1992 for his first book. So I'm a little behind on his book sale uh, track, but I'll catch up with him in due time. Amen. Just give me time. And then the last book is First Generation. Uh, it's about uh, our experiences in Nepal over the last 13 years. And there the Lord has allowed us to be a part of what I call a movement where people came from Hinduism and Buddhism in masses uh, to the Lord. And over the last 13 years, the Lord has helped us to plant over 300 churches representing about 25,000 believers. So it's just been an incredible experience. I never dreamed that I would have the opportunity to do something like that. I was just fortunate uh, to, for the Lord to give us that, that, that opportunity. And uh, so that book is about first-generation believers and uh, about the unique faith that they have. You know, people who come out of idolatry to the Lord, especially if they're the first uh, of their family, their village, their generation uh, to come to the Lord, their people, uh, they have a unique kind of innocent faith uh, that you don't find anywhere else in the world. They're like New Testament believers. They're radical, uh, they're sincere, they're, they're genuine in everything they do. Uh, there are many things they don't know, uh, 
Uh, but yet, what little they know, they're very, very powerful in that. And uh, I've decided I would prefer to have their, their little knowledge and great faith than our great knowledge and little faith. <laughs> and uh, so that's a good, it's a good book if you're curious about that, and especially if you love the world and love missions. First Generation uh, is there back on the table. All right? Now, I'd like to introduce you to my Nepali friends. Would you like to meet them? All right? So we're going to show you this is a conference. Uh, please show that video we have. It's just 15 seconds. That's my people right there. <laughs> oh, I love those guys. You know, I thought... When I came to the Lord, I thought that I had so much to give to the world, and I went out to save the world, and it wasn't going very well. <laughs> and I thought I had so much to give, but uh, what I've learned is that the poor, which is those folk that you just saw, had far more to give me than I had to give them. And uh, that's what I want to teach you about this morning, is five things I have learned from the poor. Those Nepali believers that you just saw, every one of them are church members of those 300 churches that I mentioned. They're all over West Nepal. And um, they have enriched my life in a way uh, that I could not have gotten uh, without my association with them, my friendship with them. Uh, so what I'm hoping to do this morning is to teach you uh, really the lessons I have learned in my journey of faith through life. I've traveled in over 47 countries and, and had experiences, you know, I've seen it all, done it all, had experiences that were rich and, and fulfilling. Uh, and I've learned things that only that kind of life can bring to a person. I've learned things from the poor that you can only learn by living among the poor. And uh, that's what I hope to teach you this morning. Sound like a fair deal? All right. So it'll be a little bit different, uh, but it may be life-changing for you as it has been for me. Let's pray together. Ask the Lord to open our hearts and our minds this morning. Father, may you open our, our ability to comprehend your word. May that word come alive in us and may it do a deep work in our hearts. And Lord, may we get a truth as a takeaway from this meeting. That when we leave here, we'll be somehow changed and, and better people, better believers, and stronger in our love for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I've learned that the poor have a number of things we don't have, uh, especially in the villages. How many of you have ever slept uh, through the night in a mud house with a thatch roof in a village where there's no running water and no electricity? Let me see how many. One. So you haven't had the experiences I've had. Maybe there's something you can learn from me. What I've learned first of all about the villagers is that there are three things that they have we don't have. Number one, they have a lot of mosquitoes. There are always mosquitoes there. And all night long, if you sleep in a mud house, it's, it's all night. The second thing they have is a lot of chickens. Every home in a village has a chicken. And uh, when you sleep in the village, you don't get up with the sun, which is what normal people do. I like to get up early. I like to get up when the sun rises. But I don't like to get up with the chickens. <laughs> it's for the birds. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but usually about 4.30 in the morning, some rooster is going to decide that it's time for everyone in the house to wake up. And the chicken coop in the village is always right near to the house so that the chickens are safe. And so when they wake up, they wake up everyone in the house. And someone decides to start a fire, which fills the house with smoke, and to make some tea, which the aroma of tea, there's no way you can sleep past that. So you're up by 5 o'clock, and you've still got an hour to wait for the sun to come up with no electricity. And the third thing I found that they have, unfortunately, is they always have a lot of rats. And uh, they're just, it's part of living in the village. You live close to the bush oftentimes or to the forest and you just attract uh, creatures. 
So I took a friend of mine to Nigeria, his first time to ever go uh, into the villages. We went uh, into the Niger River Delta uh, by boat, it took us about 11 hours to reach the village we were going to. And uh, we slept that night in a mud house. We, uh, they put us in a little bedroom. They had the little cots made for us there. They're very neat and tidy, uh, grass roof. And uh, when we walked into that little room, I noticed that there were rat droppings on the sheet. And so I brushed them off real quick, and, and my friend said, What was that? I said, Oh, nothing, don't worry. <laughs> He said, were those rat droppings? I said, well, yes, but you'll be okay as long as you don't sleep on your back. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, the rats, they crawl up into the thatch at night. And if you sleep on the back, on your back, and especially if you're inclined to snore, you know, it's... So what I didn't tell him is that sometimes in the night, the snakes will come up into the thatch to go after the rat. And occasionally, a snake will fall down on your bed. But he was informed on a need-to-know basis. <laughs> That's why I didn't go. Here you go. <laughs> I was just about to ask the question, who of you would like to take a missions journey with me? But, but never mind, because Pastor John just blew that whole thing out of the water. Thank you, dear Pastor. <laughs> We're going to look in the Bible uh, this morning in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Very, very simple message I want to teach you. Uh, about what I have learned, five things I've learned from the poor. And Matthew chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 3, says, God blesses those who are poor. And I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. And realize their need for Him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. There is something unique about the poor in that they have access or they have or they inherit the kingdom of heaven according to the words of Christ. But if you look at this verse carefully, you may realize that it's not poverty or being poor that brings the kingdom. In fact, I don't believe that poverty is what enables a person or permits them to possess the kingdom of heaven. We are not blessed because we're poor. We are blessed when we realize our need for Him. And this is the key to understanding the work that poverty does in a person's life. Because the poor live on the very edge of survival. Oftentimes, through the whim of nature or through the whim of circumstance, their life is threatened. And they live as on that very edge of survival, dependent on the Lord. And that dependency causes in them a faith that, that helps them to, re to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so I call this a reckless faith. And this is the first thing I learned about poverty, is that poverty will give us a kind of reckless faith. Now, please don't leave the service today and do something foolish or reckless and then blame it on me uh, because you made a mistake, because there's wisdom always in faith. But there is also this kind of recklessness that comes out of desperation. When I first came to the Lord as a young man, I lived in Mississippi. That's where I'm from. That's why you can't understand my English. Um, just listen hard. But uh, I, when I came to the Lord, I was a radical uh, believer, a radical conversion. And uh, I didn't have much. I had a house trailer, and I had a truck, and a shotgun, and a dog. And so, yeah, all I needed for survival. And, uh, but when I came to the Lord, I sold everything, including the dog, to give myself to the Lord. And that's how I started. And so my first experience to travel into the mission field, which I felt was my calling and destiny, was to a little place called Cosamala Wapan in Veracruz, Mexico. 
And I spoke there in a little mud church on the side of a cane field to about 50 people, my first time to speak in a foreign land. I was visiting a Cuban missionary, and he was uh, beginning a church there. And as I, when I finished a three-day visit, um, I had about $150 in my pocket. I gave all of that money to the Cuban missionary. And I had a bus ticket to Mexico City, an overnight bus, and I had a plane ticket from Mexico City to New Orleans to return home. And so he asked me, he said, Rick, uh, do, you, do you have any money? Are you giving me everything? I said, yes, I'm giving you everything. He said, well, what you're doing is reckless. He said, you can't just travel all across Mexico with nothing. I said, don't worry, I have a bottle of water. The Lord will provide. He said, that's stupid. <laughs> And he insisted that I take $5. And so reluctantly, I put that $5 in my pocket and got on the bus in recklessness at 10 o'clock at night. Arrived in Mexico City, and the bus dropped me at the edge of the city rather than the airport like I expected. 6 o'clock in the morning, I had a 2 o'clock in the afternoon flight. I had no pesos and no way to buy to hire a taxi because I, well, the only currency I had was 5 U.S. dollars. And so I started walking across Mexico City, dragging my little suitcase, heading to where I could see planes landing in the distance. How many of you know that was a little bit reckless? And about, do you know how big Mexico City is? You think Los Angeles is sprawling. It's insane. And so about 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm tired. I sat down on a little bench. I'd already drank all of my water. And a little man came and sat next to me, a European man, uh, blue-eyed, uh, elderly, probably in his mid to late 70s. And he spoke to me in French. And he asked me if I spoke French. I said, um, no. You know, like, why would I speak French? I'm in Mexico City. I said, do you speak English? No. Do you speak Spanish? No. And so I'm thinking, what's a Frenchman doing in the middle of Mexico City, 10 o'clock in the morning? And so through sign language, I helped him to understand that I needed to reach the airport. He said, taxi. I said, no peso. He said, bus. I said, no peso. And so he took me by the hand and walked me a few blocks to a bus station, waited with me until a bus came that had Ariel Preto on the front airport. He gave a peso to the bus driver, uh, which was probably a few pennies at that time, and uh, put me on the bus. And as I pulled out and looked back, he stood there on the curb and smiling and waving at me. <laughs> and I thought, that was the weirdest thing I've ever experienced in my life. And I had this thought, I think he might have been an angel. I mean, you know, the Bible talks about us entertaining angels unaware, and I don't mean to be spooky or weird, but I think if I ever did see an angel in all of my life, that was probably my one chance, and I totally blew it. I mean, there's so much I could have asked him, like, what's it like up there? And, you know, how's the food? And, and do you think I'm going to make it, you know? It's, just totally blew it. But it was such an uh, unusual supernatural experience that as I look back on that through 45 years of ministry, I think it was the greatest financial miracle I've ever had in my life. Now, I'm, I'm now I work to build buildings in Asia. I have a church in Pakistan of 2,000 believers. And we're building a second congregation now. We have about 500 in that congregation. And I'm working on raising the funds to help them $100,000. I have about $35,000 toward that already to help them build a building. And I've had churches give me $10,000 offerings toward that project. But I'll tell you the honest truth that that one peso miracle means more to me than a $10,000 offering means now because it was in my time of poverty when I had nothing. And the Lord gave me a miracle. I got to the airport and walked up to the American Airlines desk and there was a sign on the desk that said, Airport Departure Tax, $5. <laughs> so I have learned that there are times to be reckless 
and that there is a reckless kind of faith. Now look at your neighbor and say this. When you got nothing, you got nothing to lose. <laughs> That's what I learned in Mississippi. Now, the second thing I want to teach you is in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4, the next verse. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, we don't normally associate mourning with faith. Someone who is weeping or someone who is sad, how often do you equ equate that with faith? But yet God says, or the, the Lord says, God blesses those who mourn. Now, I work in Nepal among a group of people called the Taru. And the Taru are an ancient people who have lived in Nepal for over 3,000 years. Uh, they are rice farmers. They are at the bottom of the Hindu faith or the Hindu structure. They're the lowest of the castes there. They have been abused and neglected and taken advantage of for 3,000 years. Many of those believers that you saw on that video are Taru. About 30% of them are Taru believers. And every person you saw on that video, there were 11,000 people in that meeting of our church members. Every person you saw, 99% of them are first generation believers. That is, they're the first person in their family, in their village, in the 3,000 year history of those people to be Christians and to serve the Lord and to read the Bible. It is an amazing thing. And I have watched the faith that they exhibit. They often weep when they pray. I have seen this same pattern all over the world among the poor that when they pray, they often weep as they pray. And I have preached against it all of my life. That you need to have the joy of the Lord. That you need to know how to conquer in your faith. That you need to, when you pray, pray in faith. And, and I would ask them, let's pray together. And they would say, oh. And I would say, oh, forget it. Just forget it. Now, sometimes that can be a religious kind of expression and even a habit. But there in Nepal, I just, there was a sincerity in their prayer and in their tears. And I was in a meeting once uh, in, on the edge of a village. We had invited the, the isolated villages to come. There was a leadership meeting. And I had about 30 of our men there and was speaking to them one evening. And uh, we were in a mud building, it was a church building, had a thatch roof. And I'm in the back of the building and all those guys are kneeling in prayer, they're barefoot. Uh, and I could smell the, the curry seeping out of their pores and, and uh, everywhere that I looked in that building, everything in that building they had made with their own hands. And I was thinking about that. The mud they had dug from the ground right there where their building was erected. They build a lattice system uh, that they attach the mud to. Well, they had cut the cane for that lattice right there out of the jungle, not more than an hour's journey from where that church building sat. The timbers that were up above us and where, that framed the thatch roof, they had cut with machetes and fashioned with axes uh, and built that church with timbers that they had cut from the forest, just a half a day's journey from where that building was. In, uh, in their homes, everything you see is made with their hands. They'll take a leaf spring from an, from an erect vehicle and take it to a blacksmith who uses charcoal and homemade bellows and will fashion a digging implement or an axe or a tool out of the leaf spring from a wrecked automobile. Everything they have is literally built with their own hands. And I'm watching these guys pray and they're doing their weeping kind of prayer and I'm thinking, you know, that's, I've, I've seen that for 45 years and, and I'm so used to it. I really wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about the things around us. And I had this sudden kind of, I suppose it was a revelation of the verse in Romans 8 verse 22. Where the Bible says this, For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up into the present time. 
and we believers also groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from the sin and suffering. And as I thought about that verse and looked at those believers, I thought maybe they're so connected to creation that they hear the voice of creation itself. The Bible says this, the earth is groaning, waiting for the redemption of creation. The earth is groaning to be released from the corruption that is on the face of this earth, that is in the earth, that has, that has influenced the earth since Adam's fall. The earth itself is groaning. And maybe these believers in their own kind of simple faith, in their simple life, maybe they're hearing a voice that I cannot hear. And maybe I need to listen to them and quit trying to change them. How many of you following me here? It was a humbling moment where I thought maybe they have something for me. Maybe I can learn from them. Maybe they have a deeper spirituality than I have myself. And uh, I have begun then to understand this kind of desperate faith. Uh, this kind of desperate faith moments. We have a woman, uh, some of our pastors are women. About 30% of our leaders are women leaders, and they pastor in the villages. And some of them are our best pastors. They do a great job. And one of our women pastors called her overseeing leader, and uh, she said, his name is Pastor Mohan. And she said, Mohan, my water buffalo is dying. You need to come and pray for my water buffalo. She said, it's 10 o'clock, he said, it's 10 o'clock at night. It's a two-hour motorcycle journey to your village. I'm not coming tonight. She said, the buffalo's not going to make it until morning. Pastor, you have to come tonight. And they argued on the phone. Now, she lives in a mud house, but she has about an acre of property, and she has a mobile phone. Go figure that, you know, with a solar charger that she charges her phone with. And she would not hang up on the pastor. So finally, in anger, he said, okay, I'm coming. He got on his motorcycle, went two hours to her home, walked out there to the stall where that water buffalo was and prayed for that water buffalo, turned around, and in anger, got back on his motorcycle and went home. Now, I know this story because a few months later, about six months later, I was in her home, and she served me the best milk tea I've ever had in my life. It was rich and sweet and very strong, and, and uh, I said, this tea, I've never tasted tea so good. How do you make it? What's the difference? Uh, she said, first of all, Pastor, when we milk the water buffalo, the water buffalo milk, she said, when we built, milk the water buffalo, we milk directly into the teapot. And then we take the teapot from there and we put it on the fire. She said, it doesn't get any fresher than that. And she said, secondly, this is the miracle buffalo. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And she told me the story. It just so happened that Pastor Moan had come with me and was sitting there as she told the story, <laughs> hanging his head in shame. <laughs> she said, after Pastor prayed, nothing happened, but the next morning the water buffalo was standing in the stall. And she said, in about a month, the water buffalo began to produce milk. And she said within three months it was producing twice the milk that it had ever produced before with twice the fat content. She said that's why the tea is so good. So the moral to this story is first of all there is a desperate kind of faith. And the second moral to this story is even when your pastor is angry it's okay. Because you know what? It's not his faith that brings your miracle. It's your faith. It's your recklessness. It's your desperation that brings the supernatural into your life. How many of you understand this? The third thing I've learned from the poor is in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5. 
The Bible says, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. I have understood that there is a thing that I call respectful faith. Respectful faith. I have seen that humble people are also respectful people. When I go into Pakistan, they treat me there like a king, and it's embarrassing. I remember going to a little place. We were just starting our church in a, a little place uh, in Islamabad um, called Iqbal Town. And uh, in a little slum area where we met, I me remember going to one of our first meetings there. We were meeting in a little rented room and uh, walking through these slums where the open sewage was running down both sides of a narrow alley. And I walked down this narrow alley and I'm led to turn to the place where we're going to meet. And there lining this narrow walkway in this slum were young girls with little plastic buckets full of rose petals. And I walked through a shower of rose petals on my way to, to preach to these poor people in the ghetto. And I thought to myself, I hope no one sees this and puts it on a mobile phone and posts it to Facebook. Because, you know, hallelujah, I just look <laughs> ridiculous. And they, I mean, in Nepal, oftentimes the young people come to me, and as I've gotten older, they, they have a thing about respecting elders. You know, in the United States, the older I become, the less relevant I become. Because I can't figure out Snapchat. <laughs> you know, so I'm not, I'm not hip anymore, I'm not relevant, I got nothing to say. But in Asia, it's just the opposite. The older I become, the more respected I am. And I have young people come to me in Nepal and they'll do their hands like this and they'll, they'll bow down in front of me and they want me to touch their head and to bless them. Or sometimes in the villages where they still have a kind of very simple life, they'll come and they'll kneel and they'll touch my feet as a way of honoring me. And I say, no, no, no don't do that. It makes me feel, you know, creepy. But, <laughs> but there's a way to honor me. How many of you know that in our culture, we have lost a lot of our respect for one another? And how many of you, you may not know this, you, ex, you all say yes, yes, you all say, but what you may not understand is that one thing may have robbed us of one of the precious values of our faith. That there is a humility that faith emerges out of. And when you lose that humility, when you lose that respect, when you lose that value of honor, you also lose access to the element of faith that comes from that value. How many of you see this? All right. Are you learning something? Amen. Yeah. All right, number four, what I have learned from the poor is in the same passage, but a little further down in verse 10, Matthew 5 and verse 10. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. There is a faith that comes from persecution. It is a faith that we know little about. But when I was there in October, in the meeting you just saw, I was meeting with some of our Nepali pastors who had just crossed the border into India. And there they were ministering to Nepali believers who live on the India side and work in the farms there for very small day wages. And our pastors, there were four or five of them there that had gone. And uh, they were uh, cap captured or caught or pulled aside by a group of high caste men. And these men forced our pastors to kneel down in front of them and to kiss their feet. Then they spit on the ground and forced our pastors to lick up the spittle. And so they're telling me this, and I'm just standing there listening. I had my head down like this, listening to their story. And what they told me angered me. And I felt rage rising up within me, and I was ready to go across the border and just go Mississippi on those people. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to fight somebody. I wanted to hit somebody. I, I was angry. 
And I felt this anger. And I lifted up my eyes and I looked at these men thinking, how humiliating as a man to be stood in front of a crowd of people and humiliated in that way among others and laughed at and done the most despicable thing imaginable. How, humi how can they even be telling this story without being ashamed? And I raised my eyes in that anger and in that rage and looked at their faces and they were all smiling and their faces were glowing. And one of them said, Pastor, we thank the Lord that He has found us worthy to suffer in this manner for His sake. And I thought, dang it. <laughs> Man, I miss the angel, I miss the, you know. <laughs> yeah. God used a donkey too, so you just never know. But the joy, the, the faith that they have because of what they have experienced. They have something I don't have. Which brings me to the final point. The fifth, things I, fifth thing I've learned from the poor. And I'm departing from Matthew 5 to show a little verse to you in 1 Corinthians 12. And this verse says, The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. So this is talking about the gift of faith and the gift of healing. And if you look in this passage, it talks about many of the gifts of the Spirit and how these gifts are given to different people in the church, illustrating our interdependency upon one another to have all of the gifts of the Spirit. Because one might have faith and another might have healing and another might have other kinds of gifts. And those gifts are not all within one person, but they're divided up among the in the church. And the Lord has deliberately done this to force us to be dependent on one another. Now, when we have and understand this interdependency, then we begin to respect the value of what someone else can bring into our lives. And this is the entire point that I've been leading you to, is that oftentimes we overlook the value that resides in the poor. We tend to look at them as less than us. And sometimes we overlook the greatest gifts because we do not esteem the poor in the same way we esteem ourselves. They have a gift. It is not the same gift we have. And because it is not the gift we have, it is difficult to recognize because we have not had the experience they have had. How many of you are tracking with me in this? How many of you have ever asked yourself, why is it that I hear people like Rick come in and they tell about miracles that are taking place all over the world? How come we don't see that here? How many of you ever ask yourself that question? Well, I have too. And I've wondered, why is it that they have these miracles where water buffalo are healed and start giving twice the milk and my, you know, I can't heal my cat. What's, you know, why does that kind of thing happen? Why, why is that? Why is it they have miracles and we don't? Maybe it's because of the poverty and the poor and the journey that they've had that has taught them this lesson. And maybe if we can humble ourselves and receive from them, we can get the gift that they have. But unfortunately, we don't come to that place unless we come to a place of desperation. There's another verse in the gospel, in the book of James, verse 2, where it says, Hasn't God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith? So the Bible clearly tells us the poor are rich in faith, and the rich are usually poor in faith. How many scriptures can we point to where, the, where Jesus talks about how difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? How the rich are, think they're clothed but they're naked. On and on and on the Bible tells us about the poverty of the wealthy, who we are, whether you like it or not. We are all of us wealthy. How many of you understand this? 
And so we are lacking in a kind of faith. And until we come to a place of abject humility, we cannot receive the gift of faith that the poor have for us. Now, about five years ago, I went through a life crisis, a health crisis. I've been healthy all of my life. I've exercised aerobically since I was 30 years of age. I watch my diet. I try to watch my weight, you know, with varying levels of success. But I get the rest I need. I'm, I've always been a healthy person. I've hardly ever been sick. And the times that I have been sick, I've always thought, well, I can be sick in bed or I can be sick moving about. I just keep going along until my healing comes. So I've never missed my schedule, never missed a meeting. I have preached with fever. I have traveled with, uh, with all kinds of illnesses. You know, I've just never stopped. But about five years ago, I began to have an abdominal pain that would not go away. And this lasted for about a year and a half. And it got so bad that it was affecting my hormonal system. You know, your hormonal glands, many of them are in your, in your abdomen area. And I was beginning to become emotional. It was really bad. I'd be in a restaurant with a couple talking about, they would tell a sad story and I'd start weeping uncontrollably in a restaurant. And Beverly would look at me and say, uh, are you okay? Or I would be watching a sappy movie with Beverly and just start crying and sobbing and couldn't hardly get through the movie. And it was really embarrassing. It was troubling. I was beginning to act like a chick. <laughs> and Sorry for the language, you know. The, but we don't do that in Mississippi. We don't act like that. And it was deeply disturbing to me. So... <laughs> I knew something was wrong, and I prayed, and, and nothing happened. So I went to have some tests run, and they ran a lot of tests. They finally found, through a scan, they found spots on my pancreas. And so I go in and sit with this specialist, and he has an end-of-life discussion with me about getting my, my life in order. And I'm saying, you've got, my, you've got my case mixed up with someone else. There's an error here. He said, no. He said, in fact, I'm 10 years younger than you are, and you're far more healthy than I am, and it's disturbing for me to talk to you, looking at this, thinking this same thing could happen to me. And I'm thinking, well, that was great bedside manner. <laughs> and it shook me. And I remember going out and sitting in my car, and uh, to be honest, I think I was depressed. And, and, and this is what I'm trying to help you see here. I remember sitting in my car thinking, I've had a good life. I've seen the world. I've done everything. I'm, I'm okay with this. And I literally gave up and said, okay, I accepted death. I accepted the end. I said, okay, I'm good with this. I didn't ask me anyone to pray for me. I didn't pray for myself. And in this season, I remember following your pastor's wife's journey, Hope, and admiring how strong she was as she overcame cancer and went through chemotherapy and just strong and resilient and faithful and just kept on thinking, why can't I be like that? And I would remember admiring her journey, thinking, I've given up, and she's pressing on, wanting to live. My point is this. You know, I've always thought I was a strong person. I've always thought, you know, that uh, emotional uh, frailty was a weakness that we had to overcome by our will, and I would will myself past emotional weakness. But I reached a point in my life where I was weak emotionally, and where I had been proud of myself and my emotional and inner strength, I came to a place where I didn't have any more gas in the tank. How many of you understand this? And I gave up. Well, I went on through my life hardly praying for myself. Just went on about my routine. And about three months after that, I found myself in Nepal again. We had gathered all of our leaders together. We had about 300 leaders there. And I spoke to them for three days. And at the end of those three days, I told them what I had experienced. And I was still having this abdominal pain. And I asked them to pray for me. You know, I didn't ask the West to pray. 
because I didn't find faith in the West for that kind of prayer. But when I was among the poor, I knew the faith was there. I didn't ask my pastor to pray for me because I knew that my own faith was insufficient. That even with my pastor's prayer, something was insufficient in me. And maybe it was because of my pride. Maybe it was because of my arrogance. I don't know. I only know that I didn't have the faith. How many of you understand this? We See, we, this is the whole point. The gifts are given to the church. And there will be a time in your life, whether it's now or in your future or in your past, I can promise you this, there will be a moment in your life, in your journey on this earth, where you will not have what you need for your miracle. And you're going to have to get it from someone else. And you're going to have to humble yourself like I did and ask someone else for their faith to help you. The gift of faith. Sometimes we have it, most of the time we have it, but sometimes we don't. And sometimes we have to find it. And sometimes it might be in the person you least expect to have it. Sometimes it might be a poor person or an overlooked person or an insignificant person. And as those men gathered around me and began to pray, they entered immediately into their weeping prayers. The very thing that I had disdained all of my ministry life and preached against. They stood around me and they began weeping. <laughs> and they began to pray. And they prayed for 30 minutes and for 45 minutes and for an hour. And, and I remember standing there as they prayed. And I opened my eyes, and they were in a semicircle around me. And the ones who were closest to me were the ones that we first started with when we started that work 13 years ago. They were teenagers when we started. We had a pastor who was 16 years old pastoring a church. That's how we started. And he was standing there 10 years later, and he pastors a 500-member church, and he oversees two, 20 other churches of about 1,500 people altogether. And his, he's standing there, Inderdrev is his name. And I open my eyes and there's Inderdrev's bare f little rice farmer feet, brown, dirty toes, you know, f dirt under his toenails. And he's standing there and between his feet is a pool of tears. And between each one of those men's feet, a pool of tears, a pool of tears, a pool of tears. And I started weeping. When I saw their feet, and I felt in that moment, looking at those rice farmer feet and looking at those pools of tears, I felt like a little candle flame, just a little warm flame right in my abdomen here. And it wasn't, nothing changed, I just felt a little warmth. From that day, my health began to improve. Within about a month, my energy levels were coming back and I was able to return to my exercise routine. Within about two months, all of the abdominal pain was gone. Within about three months, I was back to my normal, healthy, good-looking self. <laughs> Amen. Now, I can't be like Hope and talk about how strong I was. In fact, my story is just the opposite. But I found my miracle. I don't know exactly what happened because I went back to the doctor and they tested again. And they said, well, these spots, they're benign tumors. They haven't grown anymore, and they're not threatening. Uh, so we don't know, you know, I don't know what happened. I can't say that I overcame cancer. I can't say I even had cancer. I don't know what I had. I only know that I had something, and that I was going down, and I was crying all the time and making a fool of myself. And somehow when those poor men prayed for me, something changed in me, and within a short time, I was back to normal. I have found that there's a faith for healing. I have found that sometimes it is not where we expect it. In fact, all kinds of faith and need is seldom where we think it is. We think it depends on pastor or an anointed service or a powerful worship moment, but you can find healing in many, many places if you're willing to humble yourself and look for it and receive from someone else. I don't know where your miracle is, I don't know what your need is, but I suspect that there are some here who have had a bad prognosis. Maybe it was an emotional prognosis, maybe like me, a physical, uh, physical prognosis regarding your health. 
Maybe it's a prognosis about your financial condition. There are many kind of desperate prognoses where it looks like we have reached the end and we're going to fail, we're going to die. That happens to everyone at some point in their lives. Let's bow our heads because I want to pray for a few of you here. I need about three or four minutes of your time. This won't take long. So no one looking around, just make this a private moment between me and you and the Lord. And you say, Pastor Rick, as you've been speaking and telling your stories and, and illustrating out of the Scriptures, I have identified with this message. And I have identified with what you just said, that I right now have, I'm in a desperate place. I've had a bad diagnosis. I've had a bad uh, uh, prognosis. I've had a bad uh, word come to me. I have a fear about where I am right now. It seems that there's no answer, no solution to what I'm facing. If that's you this morning, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to recognize you any, in any way. But I want to know who you are. If you could raise your hand so that I can see you, I want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? You can put your hand down. Let's all stand together. Go ahead, brother. The moment of faith is oftentimes a very simple thing. It's not always a profound moment. Sometimes it comes like a little warm candle. Sometimes it's so infinitesimally small that you can even miss it. But that's the moment of faith. So as we lift our hands right now, I'm going to ask everyone in this room to just lift your hand to the Lord as if you're receiving a, receiving a gift from Him. Just like a child, just lift your hands. You don't have to lift them up high. Lift them up to your comfort level. And I want to pray over you. And if you raised your hand to say, I'm in a desperate moment, Pastor Rick, let this be your candle moment, that moment where you release your faith and touch heaven for your need. Father, in the name of Jesus, May this message dig deep, deep, deep into the hearts of every believer here. And may those who have a desperate need in this moment find the warmth of your candle burning in their heart. And may they, Lord, accept your touch. And Father, just as you gave me the gift that you, you gave me from the poor, and that is now something that I have within myself and cherish and am grateful for, May you allow me the permission to give that gift to these believers here. May I be like a conduit who's taken something from the poor and, and received of them. And may you help me to give it right now in your spirit and by your spirit. May you receive right now the gift that I've got from the Taru. May you receive the gift that I receive from the poor in my journey through life. May you receive the wisdom of what the poor have taught me. And may you have the humility to receive this gift from them as you go about your life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, church. God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor. We receive it. We receive it. Uh, let's just grab a seat real quick. We're going to receive an offering for Rick. <clears throat> One of the things that um, we need to recognize as a spiritual community is that we are a spiritual community. The kingdom of God is a big C church, but then there's the small C's all over the planet where we're little battalions of God's army. We are a spiritual community. We call ourselves the Gathering Place Church. And every spiritual community has their own unique DNA and their own unique experiences. And one of the things we need to understand is when we have ministers come through like Rick, they are carrying an anointing, a special grace from God, gifts. The Apostle Paul said this in the book of Romans. I really want to come to you, church at Rome, because I want to deposit... 
I want to deposit, everybody say deposit. <laughs> I want to deposit into you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. The Apostle Paul said to his spiritual son Timothy, man, stir up that gift that's in you that you received from the laying on of my hands. So that last prayer he just prayed was an impartation prayer. The word impartation literally means like taking off a jacket and putting it on somebody else. Like Elijah, Elijah throwing his mantle on Elijah. And so that's what Rick just did. And so we are receiving the grace that's on Rick being deposited into this spiritual community. We all benefit from it. Now, one of the ways the Lord said that we receive spiritual impartations is by honoring prophets when they come through. And one of the ways we honor them is by giving them a cup of cold water, the Bible says. The Apostle Paul said, it is right for us to financially give to those who teach you the word, and then you reap their spiritual blessings. It's not manipulation, it's a kingdom economy. When God sees us honor one of his servants, then God honors us by honoring his servants. And money is one of the ways that you make that exchange in the kingdom of God. It's a spiritual reality. So, uh, Rick, I want to ask you, uh, we're going to give an offering to you right now. 100% of what you give right now is going to go to Rick. Make it out to GPC, and we'll cut Rick a, a, a check. Um, what project would you say right now is on the front burner that you would love for us to give toward? Pakistan. And what's going on in Pakistan? What, what do you need? You're building a building. You're building a building. And Pakistan, which is not a Jesus-friendly country, right? 500 in the church. And, and what is your financial goal and how much do you have? You have 35,000. And you're reaching for 100,000. Okay, good. And so, let's pray. And I want you to do what the Lord puts on your heart.